I'm Suzanne McAllister. Welcome to Full Circle. Our featured song in our music segment today is called Working Man's Blues. It will be performed by A Touch of Grass. But first, I am so pleased to have our first guest. Um, she is Connie Nordhelm Wooldridge. She is an accomplished author. Uh, Connie is a former teacher, librarian, flight attendant. She majored in Latin. Uh, she also lived in Athens, Greece, and Seoul, Korea. And you've brought that all together to have a very successful career. How many books have you written? And how has this experience of travels and living in other countries influenced your writing career? Well, I've written five picture books, Suzanne, and one um, biography for young adults, junior high, high school students. And I would say that my first published article, which was in Highlights for Children, um, is an adaptation of a Korean folk tale. So I brought my travels directly into that start of my writing career. So why is writing so important to you? Why do you write? You know, I didn't always think of myself as being a writer. I was a reader early on, and um, I think it, it progressed. I think at the beginning, I just loved books so much. And um, I first, as you said, became a teacher, and then I sort of moved closer to books when I became a librarian. And when I was at the University of Chicago in their library school, I worked as the sort of Girl Friday for a woman named Zena Sutherland who published a review of children's books. So I had my hands on the books all the time. I had to process them and I secretly read them before I took them back to her desk. And uh, at some point I just started thinking, I think I could do this. I think I could write one of these. And you did. So tell me about that very first book that you wrote. Well, the first story, this Korean folktale, I wrote in 1977, right, right around the time I was finishing graduate school. But that article was not published until 1990. Interesting. Um, I'm not good with math, but I think that's a 13-year hiatus there. What happened was I submitted the story to a book publisher, um, and I uh, managed to send it to the marketing department instead of to the editorial department. And the marketing department got back to me, told me I'd send it to the wrong place. They forwarded it, which they would never do today. And then the story was rejected. So in 1977, I decided I was washed up as a writer and put the story in my file cabinet. And it wasn't for 13 years that I did some things to learn more about how to submit a manuscript what a writer is, decided to go with a, a magazine rather than a book publisher. And so, so the article finally came out in 1990. So I think uh, one thing that I have as a takeaway from all of that is the fact that you have to be persistent and very patient when you are a writer. You also get into situations where you collaborate. I'm gonna grab one of your books here because you do picture books for children and certainly the illustrators play such an important role in these books. Um, tell me about this book, Wicked Jack, and the role that the illustrator played in this. Well, this is my first picture book. It came out in 1995, and it's a retelling of a folk tale from the Great Dismal Swamp in Virginia, North Carolina. Um, I would call the relationship between an author and an illustrator a little like an arranged marriage. What happens is I send my manuscript, my words, to an editor. If the editor decides to accept the manuscript, she, and I'll say she because I've always worked with women editors, she will look over her sort of stable of illustrators, find one that looks like he or she will work well with my manuscript, and then the editor will communicate with the illustrator and with me, but we do not talk to one another until after the book is over, that's fine, but um, all of my communication would be with the editor and the editor with the illustrator. So is that typical? It surprises me that you are writing the story and somebody is doing the wonderful pictures, but the two of you don't talk. I have my ways of getting, getting to um, my illustrators, and one of those ways is, is not by um, huge long descriptions, Wicked Jack was six feet tall, he wore brown overalls, that kind of thing. Illustrators hate that because it doesn't give them room to move, to do their thing. But I, I throw him bones, like I'll say, Jack rubbed his prickly chin. And uh, one character says to Jack, Jack, you are meaner than a rattlesnake. And those are all things that the illustrator takes to create the visual part of the character. It's my job to 
show how he looks on the inside more. And to help build that character so it does come to life on the pictures of, of your books. I wanna go back to what you said earlier though, that you had this love of reading and you loved books and, and obviously it has turned into a career for you. But what about just the joy of reading itself? You know, there, there are probably some parents and grandparents who are watching uh, today. Uh, what advice do you have for them in terms of instilling the love of the printed word with their children? Mm -hmm. You know, oftentimes I, I uh, come into contact with people who, who say they, they can't read, they're illiterate or, or they don't have time to read, but I can't overemphasize the importance of reading to children at a very early age. And when I say reading, go to the library and get a stack of, of, of uh, board books which you can chew on or read, sure, whichever, whatever your, your books, mood is. Right. And reading also has to do with, as you're driving around, there's a stop sign, S-T-O-P. You're in a restaurant, you read the menu, you're waiting in a doctor's office, you can point out the signs in the waiting room. So reading isn't just a formal act of opening a book. It starts very early with these, these connections parents make between words and, and language information, and then it gets transferred over to books. And that is such a good point because I think sometimes when we think about reading and sharing reading time with our kids, it has to be on a, uh, on a little chair with the book in front of you and you're saying, no, reading happens all the time. It does, it does. All right, does. well we are going to take a short break, but when we come back, we are going to learn more about Connie and all of the books that she's written. Stay with us. Welcome back to Full Circle. We're continuing our conversation with author Connie Nordhelm Wooldridge. She is the author of five picture books and also one biography on Edith Wharton. So let me ask you this. Many times people say, oh, I've got a book inside of me, but they don't know how to get that long journey to the first sentence behind them. Any advice on the, the writing process in terms of getting started? Well, you know, what I always tell children, students, when I go in for a school visit, and actually I make this point with an onion, a giant onion on a screen, books don't happen from the first word to the last word in the way most people think. They grow from the inside out. So I would say if people have an idea for a story, spend some time thinking about it. Just bat it around in your head. You might jot down some notes that come to you. If you have a beginning, a few sentences from the beginning or the end or wherever, jot those down. And make sure you've thought about it for a long time before you f finally sit down and try to write that first draft. Because stories grow from a kernel of an idea out. They don't grow from the first word to the last. It's not a sequential uh, process then. Not, not really. Yeah, not well really. that makes sense. Well this is another book that you have uh, written, uh, Just Find the Way They Are. Now tell me a little bit about this book because I know that there was a lot of research that had to go on. Right. Um, this, I just started getting interested on the history of, of roads and transportation, and um, I had to do an awful lot of research for that book. To um, it's, it's almost like a 200-year history lesson is what it is, but I had to make it engaging, too. Um, and the title, Just Find the Way They Are, comes directly from my life. I, at one point in my life, was sitting there with my brand new computer, having left my trusty word processor. And uh, I remember sitting there thinking, Things are just fine the way they are with my word processor. Why do I have <laughs> I to I think we can all forward? relate to that, Connie. Right. So that's the refrain of this book. People at various junctures along the way of progress saying things are just fine the way they are. Why do we have to move on? Sure, sure. And it is interesting how through pictures and through some words, you do tell that 200-year uh, history. So that, that process must take a long time, though. Of the research? Yes. or It took probably three or four years, wow. and um, it was it's not that I research one thing, I'm usually working on more than one thing, and this national road transportation thing was bubbling behind the scenes while I was working on Edith Wharton. I got totally frustrated with Edith Wharton, pulled out the, um, just find the national road information, and that's when I stumbled on Mr. John Slack, who is the person that opens up the book, and then the whole thing just kind of sparked from there. So tell me briefly about his character, and then we're going to take a look at your book trailer. Okay, um, John Slack, 
uh, was he had a tavern on the National Road before when it was still a dirt road. It wasn't even conceived of yet. And I couldn't imagine anybody not wanting better roads. But Mr. John Slack, because of his tavern, um, there was a dirt road out there and people got stuck in the mud, had to bed down at his tavern. They had to dig themselves out the next day, had to bed down in his tavern another night, and the same thing happened on their return trip, and he thought good roads were bad for business. Things were just <laughs> fine the way they were. All right, well, let's take just a minute to look at uh, this book trailer about just fine the way they are. Ah, oh, change, who needs it? When things are going fine, why can't folks just be happy? Straight roads are nice, but they bypass all the inns and small towns along the winding dirt paths. And who needs a railroad when you have a national road? America's been on the move for over 200 years. What was fine yesterday becomes a problem tomorrow. Huh. Just fine the way they are. An illustrated tale of how the dirt roads of the 1800s turned into the U.S. highways of today. Whether we need it or not. So, Connie, that is so interesting. That's the very first book trailer I've ever seen. I, we see movie trailers all the time. Why is the book trailer so important in the publishing business these days? Well, things have really changed since I published my first book. And... Um, you have, we have different ways now of getting the word out, and uh, I have a graphic designer who lives in, in Richmond, and she suggested the idea of this trailer, and uh, was the one who put it together, and it is just um, a, a modern day way of getting the word out. You can show it anywhere. It's on YouTube, so it's all over the internet, and uh, just a great way of getting the word out about the book. Yeah, that's really a, a great way to go to let everyone know. If you visit our website, we have more information about Connie's books uh, on our website, fullcircleshow.net. But don't go away just yet. We will continue our conversation with Connie after this. Are back and we're continuing our conversation about publishing, writing, and being able to collaborate with illustrators and publishers. You have a full-time job just coordinating all those people behind the scenes, don't you, Connie? Uh, it's true, Suzanne. It is. You have to wear a lot of different hats when you're a writer. Absolutely. Yes. Well, I'm fascinated by the book, The Brave Escape of Edith Wharton. Uh, this is a biography that you had written for young adults. Refresh our memory if we have forgotten um, who Edith Wharton is and why she's so important in the literary world. She was an American author. She lived right around the turn of the century, was born in 1862. Um, she did her major writing right after the 1900s and won a Pulitzer Prize in 1920, the first woman to win a Pulitzer Prize for a novel. She was a high society lady. Um, the escape that I refer to in the title is the fact that she had to escape from her life of wealth and riches in order to write. People just didn't understand why she would ever want to do that. They encouraged her to just live the life she, she'd inherited and, and uh, not write. And she was driven to write. Well, it sounds like uh, she's a very interesting person. So tell me about your new project, because I'm curious if there's a little link between your new project and Edith Wharton. Okay, my current project is a biography of Emily Post, who wrote um, an etiquette book that came out in 1922. And if you know anything about the year 1922, you're thinking flappers, uh, prohibition, so there was illegal alcohol around all over the place. Hemlines had moved up to mid-calf. It was shameless. Corsets were out the window. Women were asserting themselves. So the question was, why in the world would an etiquette book coming out in the year 1922 shoot to the top of the bestseller list? And why do you think that happened? Well, um, I, have, I have my theories. I think, first of all, it was the scope of Emily Post's etiquette book. She covered everything from um, baptism to marriage to funerals to parties to dinners, all of that. But I think the more important thing was all the etiquette books that flooded the market before that, and there, and there were just hundreds and hundreds. Emily Post thought that the superficial ideas of doing things like which fork to use, 
they were important, but she got underneath. She thought etiquette was all about being considerate, making other people feel comfortable. That was the bedrock consideration. That was the bedrock for etiquette. And anything else about it, and she kept getting these letters later in her career, which fork do I use, which fork do I use? And she finally started answering, use whatever one you want. <laughs> Um, but let's go back to Edith Wharton because there really is a similarity and I know you wanted to read a little bit uh, from her book because times were different then. Women didn't and you know people in general didn't have the information that we have now. So share this passage with us. Right. Um, both Edith Wharton and Emily Post came out of a strict Victorian society where even when they got married they knew very little about the birds and the beads so sure. to speak. And um, it affected both their marriages. Both of them ended up getting divorced. And, and they would both say that it was because they weren't allowed to interact with men before they were married Very and, and really be able to get to know them. So share some of your words with us. OK. Um, this, this is, is about th Edith Wharton. This is about Edith Wharton. And, and this is two days before her marriage. She was 23 years old. And she went to her mother because she had no idea what marriage was, what was going to happen to her. And she says to her mother, whose name is Lucretia, I'm afraid, Mama. I want to know what will happen to me. There was a silence, a long, dreadful silence. Lucretia's expression turned icy cold. You've seen enough pictures and statues in your life, she said finally. Haven't you noticed that men are made differently from women? Yes, Edith had noticed. Edith noticed everything. Well then, Lucretia demanded, Edith had no idea where her mother was going with this business about pictures and statues, so she politely waited for more explanation. For heaven's sakes, don't ask me any more silly questions, Lucretia exploded. You can't be as stupid as you pretend. Edith was stunned. She was being ridiculed for not knowing the very thing she had always been forbidden to ask. Well, that summarizes the era it gives us a good sneak peek into your ability to craft words together into a great story. Connie, it's been a real pleasure to have you here on Full Circle today. Thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me, Suzanne. Connie Nordhelm Wooldridge is our guest. She is a, an accomplished author. You can go to our website, get more information about Connie. Thanks again. Thank you. Well, we are back with our music guests after this. Stay tuned. Musical Showcase is coming up next. And now, here's our Musical Showcase. Welcome back. Joining me now is Ted Mao. He is the spokesperson for this group called A Touch of Grass. They are a remarkably talented group of men, and they are going to be performing for us right here on the program. So A Touch of Grass, describe that title, because it really does give us a sense of what type of music your group plays. Well, we do uh, play a little bit of bluegrass. That's kind of how it all started. And our banjo player down there, Mr. Bruner, he uh, started the band and uh, started with uh, a band that he was in a long time ago. And uh, this kind of evolved, and now we play a little bit of bluegrass, uh, a little bit of 60s music, some 70s music, a little bit of soul, a little bit of everything. All right, well, we like that boomer music. Well, you mentioned the banjo player. Let's go ahead and introduce all the members of your group. Mr. Pat Bruner on banjo and vocals. We have Mr. Mark M. Bowden on guitar and vocals. Over here, we have Mr. John McDowell on hat and vocals and bass. And uh, oh, and then the other hat, we have uh, Timothy Hoff on, uh, on harmonica and shakers and vocals today. All right, well, this is all about the music, and this is going to be Working Men Blues. I'm Suzanne McAllister. I will see you next time, full circle. Guys? It's a big job just to get in by with nine kids and a wife. I've been a working man, dang near all my life, and I've been working. Monday morning, I'm a right back with the crew. Yeah. yeah, I drink a little beer in the evening and sing a little bit of these working men. 
I keep my nose to the grindstone. I work hard every day. Get a little tired on the weekend. As soon as I draw my pay, better go back work. Monday morning, I'm right back with the crew. Yeah, I drink a little beer in the evening and sing a little bit of these working man blues. Hey, hey, working man, working man like a beat. Never been on a welfare man, that's a no place I'm gonna be cause I've been a working. As long as these two hands are fit to use. Yeah, I drink a little beer in the evening and sing a little bit of these working man blues. Here comes that working harmonica, man. About a leaving, do a little bumming around, throw my bills out the window, grab a train to another town, but I go back working. Gotta buy my kids a brand new pair of shoes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I drink a little beer in the evening and sing a little bit of these working man. Because that working guitar player. Never been on a welfare man, that's no place I'm gonna be, cause I've been a world.